All right, let's get started. Stop share, that would be good. All right, Kia ora, welcome everyone to the sixth New Zealand Marine Science webinar. My name is Mareike Babuda and I'm going to be the host for today. I just want to uh, let you know that this seminar will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel from tomorrow onwards together with other um, previous sessions. If you're not a New Zealand Marine Science Society member yet, I would encourage you to um, go to our website nzms.org and subscribe. We are the New Zealand's largest marine society, um, scientific community and it's definitely worth to be a member. Um, the topic of today's webinar is marine invasive species and biosecurity, and I'm delighted to welcome four fantastic scientists who are going to present their research with us today. If you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to use the question and answer button on the bottom of your screen. You can write anything um, during the talk, and we have three minutes after each talk to read out the questions as well. Um, with this, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Um, it's um, Caden um, Leonard. Um, Caden is a marine biosecurity specialist at Northland uh, Regional Council with more than 10 years expertise in marine invasion, invasion ecology and biogeography. Northland's Regional Council biosecurity program focuses on active targeted marine pest surveillance and incursion management across no Northland's 10 harbors, 10, Northland's 10 harbors <laughs> and coastline. And today he's going to talk about the eradication efforts for an unwanted fan worm in the Bay of Islands. All right, uh, can we see that? Excellent. All right, well, uh, kia ora everyone. Thank you for uh, joining. Um, basically, I'm just going to give a bit of a situational report on the uh, response for uh, Sabella in the um, Bay of Islands, um, specifically in the Opua Basin. <clears throat> so uh, firstly, we'll just start off with a little bit of uh, Sabella 101. Um, Spella was first detected in New Zealand in uh, 2008 in Littleton Harbour and unfortunately has since spread to a number of different harbours around New Zealand, um, including Waitamata, Whangarei and Coromandel Harbour. Uh, this is an exhaustive list, um, it has been detected in numerous other harbours and is currently being managed in a few like uh, Nelson and Tauranga. Uh, Sabella is a um, a very successful invader. Um, it has all these sort of weedy characteristics that we see in marine invaders um, being highly fecund. Um, the female can have in excess of 50,000 eggs during each spawning event. Um, they're capable of reaching reproductive maturity very quickly. Um, and it's often considered that a individual around 120 mil is uh, reproductively active. Uh, there's a bit of contention to what their spawning time is. Um, some studies say it's year round, uh, others say May to late September. It seems to be a bit of a general consensus though that there is a peak in um, late winter. Someone will probably say I'm wrong on that one though. Um, they are able to regenerate body parts if they're damaged. Um, notably, if you uh, cut one of these worms in half, you end up with two. Um, and there's no known predators um, yet in New Zealand. And this is quite often attributed to the fact that they bioaccumulate arsenic in, um, and it's the strongest in their, their feeding crown. They're habitat generalists, meaning they can live on most artificial and natural substrates. Um, and they're often found um, in areas where you wouldn't expect to find them, so sandy substrates and they're attached to just little bits of shell. The larvae remain in the water column for up to three weeks, um, giving them plenty of time to find suitable substrate, and they're gregarious, uh, meaning that they settle in clusters or um, near adults. So, um, unfortunately, sorry, I just jumped forward. Uh, unfortunately, a uh, 
um, Sabella was detected in the Bay of Islands in early July 2018. And this was uh, one individual on a mooring block. Um, it was found by mooring contractors soon after NRC staff held a marine pest ID workshop. So it's a bit of a uh, win and a bit of a fail at the same time. Um, and subsequent diving found that there was a sort of a multi-generational population out there. Now, within the marine environment, um, eradications are quite rare, but given the importance of the Bay of Islands across multiple fronts, including uh, having high environmental values, um, high um, economic values, and uh, specifically really high uh, cultural values, it was decided um, with Council and Biosecurity in New Zealand to pursue eradication attempts. Um, and this was a 50-50 uh, share cost model. Uh, to be honest, I have only come in to it in, in and I see at the tail end of this incursion response, so I can't take credit for a lot of the uh, wins that I've had, uh, but I am able to look back and look at some of the hurdles that have been faced. Uh, specifically, there has been an um, uh, issue with commitment to funding and also resources, specifically um, the staff's ability to be able to uh, manage this incursion as well as doing the usual day-to-day -day business as usual stuff. Uh, so at the end of sort of um, 2019, the population was growing and um, unfortunately it was starting to get to a level which was uh, unmanageable. Um, and then we had a, a number of different flooding events, which I'll have a chat about soon. So to date, um, here's a couple of maps on the... Uh, the left here, we have all the transect lines that have been conducted in Okua. Uh, red and green is the start and the stop. Uh, so as you can see, they've, they've searched sort of far and wide, but then on the right is um, heat maps of where individuals have been detected. Um, so as we can see here, we still have quite limited dispersal within the Okua Basin. And just to validate that, uh, MPI have kindly run some um, dispersal maps for us with uh, release of proper gills in a few different places. Uh, on the uh, left here, we have release at the marina and on the right is release at Tapu Point, which is one of the hotspots. Um, in both uh, cases here, we can see that we do have quite limited dispersal um, and even better, we do have dispersal back up towards the um, Waikari Inlet and uh, Kawakawa uh, River here. Both areas which have less artificial substrates and are impacted more by freshwater input. So talking of freshwater input, um, in mid-July, we had a very significant flood event. It was... Um, hailed as being a sort of a one in a hundred year rain event. And this really impacted all the soft body animals on a lot of the marina structures and a lot of our artificial structures. Uh, so we decided, yes, we have to uh, jump back in and um, see what the population looked like after that. Um, just gonna quickly throw up a couple of uh, maps showing um, the flow of fresh water um, in a river that feeds into the Kawakawa uh, River. And as we see here on our flood, which was mid-July, we've had a massive spike in um, meters cubed per second of uh, water flowing down the river. Uh, we can also see that prior, this is since the start of the incursion, we've had a really uncharacteristic, uncharacteristic dry spell. Um, looking at historical um, flow events, really, um, the, the freshwater input we had isn't really that unusual. Um, we have had a number of these in the past and some of them have been um, quite significant. 
um, which takes us back to the original detection where it was assumed at the time that the population had been there for quite some time. So perhaps um, it, it's been there longer than we've known and it has been regulated by um, these freshwater events. So as I said, after the uh, freshwater um, input, we did have to uh, jump back in and um, have a look at it and see what's going on. So we only had a little bit of funding, so we only dived a representative subset of the different um, substrate types. And this included the marina, the, the moorings around there, seafloor and different artificial substrates like channel markers and jetties. Um, I just threw up this uh, nautical map, all the triangles here represent the moorings we have in the area. So it's a, um, there is a lot of artificial substrate out there that is not just the uh, marina. And we also did a, um, some delimiting. So this is just a uh, quick picture of uh, what we did in the latest round. This was only 14 days diving. And um, again, we did a whole series of uh, transect lines focusing uh, strictly just on the marine, uh, on the seafloor, sorry, and a couple of meters up each of the piles. Uh, we were very confident that everything um, on the floating structures was dead. So yeah, it was specifically diving the seafloor to see what population remained. Uh, and we also did a lot of mooring blocks. Um, on the left hand side here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, right hand side. Uh, so, really, we found uh, 20 alive Sabella. Um, nine of these were on artificial structures, 10 on the seafloor, and one on a mooring block, um, which is uh, somewhat exciting. Um, however, all of the individuals we found were considered to be reproductively viable. Um, so yes, we have a very small um, sporadically dispersed population out there, uh, but they are reproductively viable. So um, we do have to act quick on that one. Um, here's just uh, the results in the wider context. Um, really hard to um, compare between these different um, responses because they all focused on doing different things from delimiting to search and destroy um, and were all interrupted by um, different weather events or um, funding funding rounds. Uh, so moving forward, um, we have, um, <coughs> excellent, thank you. Uh, so moving forward, we um, have really gone back to council and said that we need to front end load this um, response, we need commitment up front and for five years, and um, there is a lot of appetite there for that. Um, so we have this commitment, so we will be jumping back in to dive the, uh, the footprint of the marina and all the high risk areas, removing individuals. And we've got the commitment to be able to do this every six months. So we won't be waiting um, between different responses for new financial years to finish or um, financial years to start, um, we'll be able to really just um, respond when the conditions are right, when the reproductive seasons are right. Um, secondly, we'll be um, engaging a separate contact contractor to redo random sections um, bi-monthly, and these will be seafloor grids and definable sort of marina structures. This is repeated measured sites, and this is so we can quantify uh, reinfection rates, diving failure rates, and um, also take random quadrat scrapings so we can determine if there has been a recruitment event. And these are our real strict stop-go requirements. So um, yeah, we don't want to keep on going if we can't achieve it and if our tools aren't um, right. So uh, yeah, and this will also allow for adequate staffing resources, which will provide agility in management um, and operational decisions. And it will also allow us to engage with Iwi and Hapu and different stakeholders. Um, at the moment, we have a lot of drive, ability and knowledge out there. 
um, and willingness from Kaitiaki to be involved. Um, but unfortunately, um, we haven't been able to follow up on this due to uh, lack of resources. Um, excellent, that's all I have. So any questions? Awesome, thank you very much. I have uh, two questions from the audience. The first one is, is there any chemical treatment that can reduce Sabella? And the other one is, does Sabella outcompete other worm species? Um, yes, so chemical treatment, uh, obviously there is, uh, there's nothing out there where we can, where we can treat the whole area um, without killing everything else. Um, so uh, no, freshwater seems to be our um, biggest thing at the moment, um, but there's nothing we can actually just dump in the water. And um, if it was a marina where we could shut off, we could treat with chlorine, um, obviously there would be um, yeah, a lot of engagement there. But uh, unfortunately, no, we don't have tools to better manage them. Um, and do they outcompete other worms? Sabella, we're, we're very, we're at the early stages of this incursion. Um, so I only turned up in 2008, but Sabella does uh, compete lots of species. Um, they form dense beds, sort of a thousand individuals per square meter. Um, they're a canopy forming species. Um, and they have this really extended spawning period where they're able to um, out, out compete our natives. So um, while, while we don't have a lot of data out there, it's um, assumed that yes, they are able to out compete the natives. Okay, I have another question from the audience regarding predation. There have been some anecdotal accounts of parore feeding on Sabella. Have you heard anything about that? I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, sorry, what was the species? Uh, parore? Yep. Parore? Sorry. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about that myself. Um, back when I was um, at the University of Waikato, we uh, we did a lot of diving under vessels where Sabella had dropped out. I have noticed uh, native fish eating them when they're not in their protective hard tube. Um, we did do a handful of experiments back in the day that didn't really go anywhere and did find things like uh, amphipods and that may eat them again once they were they'd fallen out of their uh, protective tubes, but nothing was done sort of experimentally properly. So I I can imagine something's out there that's able to eat them, but we just really don't know yet. Okay, Good thank work. you very much. Awesome. We unfortunately have to go to the second speaker. Um, we can read out questions in the end if there are more, if we have time. Thank you very much. Would you mind you. finishing sharing your screen? Awesome, thank you. Our next speaker is Kai Hillemann. Hillem, Hilliam, sorry. <laughs> he recently <laughs> completed his master in marine science at the Lee Marine Lab uh, under Dr. Ian Tuck and Dr. Richard Taylor. And he's going to report on the continued invasion of the Asian paddle crab in the northern, in the north of New Zealand. Awesome, thanks Marika. So as Marika mentioned, uh, I've just finished my master's on the Asian petal crab in the north of New Zealand uh, under Ian Tuck and Richard Taylor. So the Asian petal crab uh, is native to Asia, surprisingly, uh, which includes Korea, Malaysia, Japan, and Taiwan. Uh, the crab is able to, to survive in a wide range of temperatures and salinities, as well as low oxygen conditions, and inhabits estuaries, harbors uh, that are, I have a firm sand or a muddy sand bottom, as well as eelgrass meadows and even rocky intertidal shores. Crabdis has a broad omnivorous diet, including crustaceans, fish, bivalves, and squid and is also a commercially important species uh, in Asia. Charybdis undergoes spawning between May to August uh, within its home range, while sea temperatures are between 20 to 28 degrees Celsius, and females can lay between 200,000 to just under 500,000 eggs per brood, depending on where the population is, 
and they can have up to three broods over their spawning period. So Cryptus was first observed in Auckland Harbour in September of 2000 by commercial flounder fishermen. Uh, this was the first introduction outside of Cryptus's native range with other individuals also being found in Perth and Italy in the past. The vector of introduction is believed to be ballast water uh, ejected into the harbour. And by 2015, Cryptus had spread along the east coast of the North Island. Studies of the population genetics of Cryptus in the Waitemata Harbour has illustrated that Japan is the most likely source of this invasion, with the population descended from as few as three individuals. And within the Waitemata Harbour, Cryptus has been shown to be a habitat generalist, overlapping and distribution with our native petal crab, uh, but was significantly associated with estuarine habitats. And Cryptus is also shown to be more aggressive and outcompete our native petal crab, uh, even at a smaller size. And the spawning period is also much longer in New Zealand, spanning five months from November to March, uh, with females regularly having over 500,000 eggs per brood. So my project had four main research aims. Uh, the first was to determine the distribution and pathways and vectors of spread for Cryptus within New Zealand to examine the morphometrics and population dynamics across several populations within the North Island, uh, examine the influence of large male crabs on catch composition and behavior of other crabs around the pots, and figure out where juveniles were distributed and how to best catch them. So as I mentioned, as of 2015, Cryptus had spread along the East Coast. This includes occurrences at uh, Opua, Whangarei Harbor, Maharangi, uh, Waitemata Harbour, Whangapura Peninsula, and Whangapua on the Coromandel Peninsula. And previous work has also shown that Cryptus are not limited by their salinity or thermal tolerances uh, throughout the entirety of New Zealand, with predicted spread and establishment across estuaries within the North Island. So to determine their distribution, I interviewed uh, commercial flounder fishermen with a questionnaire as well as compiled distribution data from Auckland and Bay of Plenty Regional Councils, as well as the MPI biosecurity porthole and the iNaturalist app as well. And I also undertook some subtitle sampling across four sites, but this was mainly involved uh, in my second research aim. So this figure here is the compilation of all of this distribution data uh, as of the beginning of 2020. So it shows us that Cryptus is now present uh, within the Tauranga Harbour, having an established population there, as well as being present in Ohiwa Harbour and on Great Barrier Island. And Cryptus has also made the jump across, uh, across to the west coast, now being established within Kaipara, Hokianga and Manukau Harbours as well. So this figure here is, is an invasion rate map for Cryptus in New Zealand. And the darker points indicate uh, earlier occurrences, and the lighter points indicate more recent occurrences. But the main theme of this figure is that Cryptus is steadily spread throughout the North Island, with a new bay harbor or estuary being invaded every two to three years. So, a quick conclusion for this research aim uh, Cryptus is now present on the east and west coasts over a wide geographic range uh, with a steady spread occurring. The pathways and vectors likely responsible for the spread include dispersal via currents, aquaculture, commercial and recreational shipping. Within invaded areas, Cryptus has become extremely abundant and present in high numbers throughout a harbour after around four years. And population abundances, as reported by commercial fishermen, indicate that populations are continuing to grow and no significant decrease in population abundance has occurred to date. And for my second research aim, uh, to examine the morphometrics and population structure, I subtitly sampled at these four sites across the Auckland region, at Port Albert in the Kuiper Harbour, Weeti River at Whangapura Peninsula, Bayswater Marina in the Waitemata Harbour, and Onihunga Wharf in the Manukau Harbour. 
I took uh, various morphometric measurements, which I'll show you in the next slide. And I also undertook a tag and recapture program of individuals across the four sites to observe any growth or give me a rough estimate for population size in um, each sampling area. So these are the morphometric measurements that I took. So I had four across the carapace, as well as two across each claw, with um, one claw being defined as the major or crusher claw if it had molariform teeth present, as well as two measurements across the abdomen. Uh, I also weighed every single crab and noted any damage and the different coloration of the crabs. So overall, uh, male crabs dominated the catch with sex ratios at each site, often being 10 males to one female. And male crabs were also significantly larger than females, which was expected. Uh, gravid females were the second largest group, which, uh, however, they were not as abundant as non-gravid females. There was also some temporal variation uh, through my sampling with the most male crabs being caught in month four here, which corresponds to the second half of October. The most non-gravid females were caught in the first half of November and the most gravid females were caught in uh, the second half of November, which lines up with the beginning of their spawning period. Uh, male crabdus exhibited greater growth for their claw lengths when compared to females, but not heights. And both male and female crabs predominantly had their uh, crushed claw on the right hand side as well. So I caught my first uh, gravid female at the end of October at Bayswater Marina in the Waitemata Harbour, uh, aligning with previous work done on the spawning period. I managed to determine a possible size for morphometric maturity for males based off their claw morphometry. However, the data for this was very limited due to a very low catch for male juvenile crabs. All sites were similar size-wise, excluding uh, Port Albert and the Kuiper Harbour but there were differences in morphometry between the East and West Coast populations. And there was also a very low recapture rate with only four tagged individuals recovered of, of, of the over 100 ta uh, crabs tagged. So to look at the influence of large male crabs on catch and behavior, I uh, undertook some pot trials at the Lee Marine Lab using uh, biosecurity traps which were left to soak in 5,000 liter tanks uh, for 16 hours with sediment across the bottom, which isn't shown in this figure here. And then for my male treatment, I placed a large male crab of greater than 70 millimeters carapace width uh, into the trap. I also seeded some traps uh, in situ with large male crabs present as well as analyzing all of my catch data from my morphometric sampling in my secondary research aim. So my control treatment or the regular beta traps uh, saw capture of 10 crabs and five crabs for the male treatment. Uh, approaches to the trap by crabs within the tank were significantly greater for the control treatment uh, compared to the male treatment, but there was no significant difference present for the other metrics. Uh, large male crabs were the dominant size class within field catch and substantially more females were caught when one or two crabs were present within the trap compared to three or four. And this um, trend is also present for males. And of my male seeded traps deployed in the field, I didn't catch any further crabs. Uh, I also deployed some baited traps in the same areas at the same time and these traps yielded several individuals. So several conclusions can be drawn from these results and the qualitative observations in the field. Uh, firstly, large male crab does significantly reduce the number of approaches other crabs make towards the trap and significantly increase agonistic and aggressive interactions with other crabs. Uh, second, the presence of a large male within the trap did not significantly affect entries of other crabs, but this may be a result of the low number of trials I was able to run 
or the lack of diversity within sex and size class included within the tank trials as they were mainly um, males. And finally, uh, cribbed as a court predominantly with one or two individuals in the trap due to their aggressive nature. And for my fourth research aim to look at juvenile distribution, I analyzed the port survey data from the Kuiper Harbor from Auckland Council. Uh, who used various methods to detect Charybdis across the harbour, uh, as well as including any information that I could obtain from uh, flounder fishermen, as well from my first research aim. So within the Kuiper Harbour, 50 juvenile crabs were caught, uh, and this was via all of the methods from the previous slide. Several crabs were also found within the intertidal zone, moderately buried in sediment or sheltering underneath rocks, which, uh, as far as I'm aware, hasn't occurred in New Zealand to date. Uh, but across the Kuiper Harbour, a trend of juveniles being present closer to the mouth of the harbour is observed, and juvenile distribution was interspersed with large male individuals, which is also reflected within their native range, particularly uh, within Japan's populations. So the most effective method for capturing small juvenile uh, cryptus was the benthic sled tow, uh, followed by shore searches, which yielded uh, juveniles as well as small adults and crab traps were the least effective method catching largely adults. So to conclude, uh, cryptus is spreading throughout the North Island with the spread only likely to continue. Uh, there were significant differences between male and female morphometry and ac across the morphometry from the various sites, uh, adding to the previous work done. And findings from the pot trials and juvenile distribution analysis can aid future monitoring of the spread of Charybdis into new harbors by providing information on how to best detect them using these methods. But overall, this work illustrates that further genetic studies are required to um, due to this increased distribution to determine if another invasion has occurred or the same uh, population has steadily spread throughout the North Island. Uh, references and I'd like to thank uh, everyone for being involved in my project and questions. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, we have some questions from the audience. We only have time for two, I guess. So the first one is, is there any potential commercial market for this crab in New Zealand? Uh, there, I'd say there definitely could be a market for them. They do have a market for them within Asia, but then that also raises the issue of people start um, gaining from them economically uh, with people spreading them to other parts of New Zealand to try and earn some money as well. And it might just have a, a net negative impact rather than reducing those already present populations. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, are there, is there any evidence of novel diseases being introduced to native crab species? Uh, I know they can carry white spot syndrome virus, but there hasn't been any evidence of them introducing uh, diseases to the native paddle crabs at this stage. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Our uh, third presenter is Irene Middleton. She is a PhD candidate at Massa University. And she um, has worked in marine aquaculture, biosecurity and ecology in Northland for the last 10 years. And her current research builds on her expertise in these roles. Irene's research combines citizen science observations and expert knowledge to investigate changes in Aotearoa's fish diversity and response to climate change and human-mediated interact introductions. Yeah. Hello. Um, tēnā koe. Thank you for the opportunity to present our research in this forum. Today I'm going to be presenting one of the chapters from my PhD where we harness citizen science observations and combine that with expert knowledge to identify human mediated and natural range extensions in New Zealand waters, both of which pose a biosecurity threat to New Zealand's e marine ecosystem. Climate change is altering our marine systems with one of the most obvious changes being the geographic shifts of species distributions. Natural and human mediated range shifts may differ in their vector of spread, but they're both stage wise and the factors impacting the persistence and population increase in recipient communities are similar. 
The majority of marine fishes and invertebrates are ectotherms, so they're sensitive to climate change, as ambient temperature moderates their physiology, reproduction, and survival. <clears throat> If a rain shifting species is able to persist in a new location, it could have broad scale impacts on ecosystems and fisheries and recipient locations, regardless of the vector of spread. Although climate mediated rain shifts do not have the same notoriety as human mediated introductions, like those that we've heard of previously with um, Kyle and Caden with the Sabella and um, Japanese paddle crab, there are examples where rain shifting species have had negative impacts on recipient ecosystems. In these cases, those species have competed with native species and modified community structure, presenting environmental, economic, and social challenges. And one of the examples of this is the, um, the poleward range shift of the tropical urchin Centrostephanus rogersii in South Australia. Um, and that coupled with thermal stress has caused widespread losses of canopy forming calps, which has significantly altered the ecosystem. We've not yet witnessed such broad scale changes in New Zealand, so we have an opportunity to get ahead of the problem and detect climate mediated range extensions early, and also identify how climate might be impacting the persistence of human mediated um, range shifts in New Zealand, particularly. Um, by um, nature, uh, invasive species and range extending species are inherently rare, particularly at the early stages of introduction. And um, as Caden mentioned, they're difficult to detect. Um, and it's logistically expensive, particularly so in New Zealand. Um, the, marine New the marine setting in New Zealand is really complex. We have a huge coastline, um, as you can see from this figure, a huge number of vessel movements to our coast, um, a range of ecosystems in a complex oceanic setting. And as scientists, we can't be everywhere monitoring everything at once. So thankfully, citizen science, namely the observations made by volunteers and members of the public, is being recognized as a tool to better anticipate change and identify range extending species. And a successful example of this is the Range Extension Database Mapping Project or REDMAP in Australia, where they engage with fishers and divers to track poleward range shifts, um, indicator species and invasive species. In New Zealand, we do rely on the general public to report known pests to biosecurity, but as far as we're aware, before we started this project, there was not an active network of citizens reporting those species that are not yet known to be pests, but could present biosecurity threats. Um, <clears throat> citizen science data is readily available across spatial and temporal scales that often exceed scientific survey data. However, they can be spatially biased and can be of varied quality. You can imagine people are likely to go diving in places like the Poor Nights or go fishing out the Mokahina Islands and are less inclined to do so in places like Opua or um, the Kaipara Harbour. So building on the methods we used by REDMAP that I mentioned earlier, we developed a qualitative method to combine citizen science observations with expert knowledge to overcome the shortcomings of each when identifying marine range extensions in New Zealand waters. <clears throat> Our method comprised of five linked steps and consolidates three data sources, namely expert knowledge, citizen science and published literature to increase the accuracy of species classifications in a simple qualitative manner. And you might look at this overview figure and think, well, that doesn't look that simple to me. Um, but we are going to go through each of those steps individually with some hypothetical scenarios. Um, and I just wanted you to see how they all kind of link together. So we've um, implemented um, our method and we've submitted a manuscript to diversity and distributions and that has been sent back to us and we are um, reviewing that and resubmitting that soon. And in this example, we use uh, shallow water ray finned fishes as an, in mainland New Zealand as our case study. And we did this because they're charismatic species and are often likely to be encountered by ocean going citizens. Furthermore, shallow water species are um, a good indicator of climate change. However, that doesn't mean that our um, method can't be applied to a, a range of invertebrates or other organisms, or organisms with just some minor tweaks to accommodate um, biological traits. <clears throat> So I'm going to go through those steps here now. Um, for step one, we put together an expert panel um, to classify the confidence in species natural ranges. And two, this was because if we don't know where the ranges are currently, we can't actually identify any out of range occurrences. To do this, we queried taxonomic status, the knowledge of the species range and seasonality to reach a classification. So for this example, um, these are from our manuscript, the um, Amphiketodon howensis or Lord Howe coralfish. We decided there wasn't any taxonomic confusion for this species. There's a map of the species range in New Zealand. It doesn't vary seasonally. 
and the experts confirmed that they're happy with the map that exists. So we have high confidence that we know where that species is supposed to occur in New Zealand waters. If we then look at Imobrancus anoleus, which is the oyster blenny, um, there could be some identification issues with this species. It's quite small and cryptic. However, the expert panel during the HUI decided that they could um, determine a putative map for the species. So we still have a level of confidence that we know where it's supposed to exist, but it's lower than for something as obvious as the Lord Howe coral fish. Furthermore, during that one day HUI with the expert panel, we also determined a detectability score for each species. And this was based on their natural patterns of abundance, conspicuousness and occurrence in observed habitats. And together with that range confidence, this, this detectability score con contributed to our overall confidence in being able to accurately classify our sightings in step three. So with those two previous steps, steps um, one and two, we used uh, expert knowledge and published literature. And this is where we start bringing in our citizen science observations. So here we ran each individual observation through a decision tree that included species maturity and the number of individuals cited. And both of these things impact on the ability for focal taxa to breed and establish founder populations. But if a species is, uh, sorry, if an individual is mature, it's also likely to already have survived a number of um, winters, which means that they are actually able to persist in the location. So in a hypothetical scenario, remember this is a hypothetical we haven't actually found two Lord Howe coral fish in Taranaki. These, uh, we say we found two mature Lord Howe coral fish in Taranaki well outside of their known range. So this has been identified a rate as a range extension because they have persisted there already and they're likely to be able to breed if there's more than one. Um, if we look at a single juvenile oyster blenny up in Paringaringa, still well outside of its known range, is likely to be an extra limital vagrant. Um, it can't establish a population there and it's unlikely to persist long term. <clears throat> if a focal taxa observation was deemed to be outside of its known range in that previous step, we, um, so either as an extra limital occurrence or a potential range extension, we ran a post hoc assess assessment to determine whether or not this occurrence was likely due to human mediated dispersal. Um, this assessment considered the current knowledge of the species as a pest. Um, the contiguity of its known range, the likelihood it would raft or foul vessels, and um, if it's a recognised aquarium species, i.e. that it could be introduced um, inadvertently or on purpose to New Zealand. So if we add a little bit of metadata around our examples here, um, if the two Lord Howe coral fish were sighted on a natural reef structure, we run that through our um, assessment, Yes, they were outside of their known range. It's not a known invasive species. Its range is not contiguous outside of New Zealand, but it's not traded as a marine ornamental and it's not known to foul, structure, foul vessels or structures. So it's unlikely that that was due to human mediated dispersal and it's likely to be a natural range extension. However, if the oyster blenny was found in Paringaring on a wharf structure, we do come to a different conclusion there. Yes, it's outside of its range. It's not a known invasive species, and that's taking into account um, international and national um, databases of, of um, invasive species. Its range isn't contiguous. It's not a marine ornamental, but it has been known to, foul, to associate with biofouling, and it was found in an area of high anthropogenic disturbance or in a man-made structure. So it's likely that that occurrence was due to some um, form of human-mediated pathway. Ultimately, our method results in a current known range for a focal species, so that's pretty important. Um, a classification for each observation of a focal species with an associated level of confidence in that classification and a likelihood that whether of that, a likelihood that that observation was due to um, human mediated vectors. So for the uh, manuscript we're just um, looking to resubmit, we um, ran 10 focal taxa through our assessment of varying sizes and life history traits and found two that were data deficient right at the start. Um, so that meant that we couldn't actually determine a range um, and hence not identify any out of range of sightings. So they might be um, species we want to spend a bit more time collecting data for. However, most of the um, observations were within the known ranges. So those are the blue dots on this figure here. We did um, observe a number of um, range extensions and extra limital vagrants, and two of those, um, the red dots in panels G and H, 
were likely due to human mediated vectors. And interestingly, um, they were both in Paringa Harbour, which suggests that this might be an area of change that might want to be monitored more closely. Um, here's looking at you, Caden. <laughs> Um, so climate change uh, will create new biosecurity challenges, and these will include the establishment of range extending species and invasive species. Um, and Biosecurity New Zealand identified the potential establishment of subtropical and tropical pests and current seasonal immigrants as one of the greatest concerns. So they are our range extenders and our extra limited vagrants. Our method is unique in that it allows for the rapid real-time classification of observations rather than trying to classify a species as a whole. Um, which allows for quick responses, higher resolution of trends in the spatial temporal context, and um, allows us to identify hotspots of change rather than just focusing on one species individually. Um, going forward, we're going to keep um, collecting this data, and we hope to um, formalise our data collection by developing a website or an app um, funding allowing um, to uh, automate our method workflow. Um, and we're wanting to do that in collaboration with interested communities and government agencies. And this will allow for increased spatial coverage of our um, method, increased knowledge of species ranges. So we have a really solid baseline for when we're starting to see those significant climate change events. Um, and also allows for better engagement between citizen scientists and the science community and empowerment of those citizen scientists. So I have a whole bunch of people I'd like to thank, um, including our awesome next speaker, um, for the work that we did here. Um, and I'm more than happy uh, to take any questions if people have some. Fantastic. Thank you. It sounds like an amazing project you're being part of here. <laughs> we have uh, two questions from the audience. Cool. Uh, the first one is, are, there, are some of this invasive species breeding? Uh, yes, uh, certainly there are um, accounts of uh, breeding behaviours with some of these range extending species and that's one of the most interesting things we're starting to see is that these species are overwintering um, and we're actually identifying mature fish um, at, in late in the winter so they've already overwintered so we know that they are able to overwinter, they're showing breeding colours and behaviours, so it's a nice thing about fish, for especially wrasses, we can identify when they're sexually mature and they are able to breed, and we're seeing those behaviours. So it is starting, um, particularly because our winters are warming, but we have kind of have an opportunity now, we're in that middle ground where we can set those baselines so we can monitor that change um, going forward. Great, thank you. Another question is, um, if your project um, involves also other species, non-fish species, like habitat formers. Um, yeah, so we include a number of um, invertebrates in our um, research as well. So we focused on fish for that um, manuscript that we just submitted. So that's what this public um, this presentation was based around. But we also um, monitor things like the Centra stephanus urchin that I mentioned is a problem in South Australia, and that is, is on this on this image here. You can see that um, species, and a number excuse me, and a number of other invertebrates. Currently, we haven't. Um, we don't include things like corals or um, uh, seaweeds in our study, but um, that would be something that we'd look at uh, when we start to expand and formalize this project. We'd, it's really easy to tack species onto this um, method and we've tried to keep it as open as possible. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Irene. Oh, no worries. Okay, now we come to our last speaker, it's Sophia Clark, and she is a senior advisor in the long-term planning division of Biosecurity New Zealand. She is currently leading the program of work to develop a nationally coordinated approach to manage post-border marine biosecurity. And her topic today is progressing a national approach to managing biosecu marine biosecurity. Oh, thank you very much. Um, kia ora everybody. Really nice to see some familiar names um, joining us today. And um, yeah, thanks Irene for the little, the little mention. I have to mention Irene here as well. Just about all my images I use are hers or Crispin's or Richie Hughes from Newa. So thanks very much for the beautiful photography. Um, yeah, I just want to speak a little bit today about um, this sort of national strategy that Biosecurity New Zealand is, is developing, um, which is really awesome because it sort of ties in everything that's just been mentioned, you know, you, the research community, um, where we want to go with some of these, these pieces of work and how we can use them and what do we want to achieve in the post-border space. 
And if I can go next, there we go. So we um, we have quite a robust um, marine biosecurity system. Um, from the assessment of risk before it gets into the country and then um, our surveillance that we do at the border to detect anything that, um, that might be arriving here through different pathways. Um, then our sort of incursion investigation and response groups and then long-term management of the, what the species that we do have here and what we wanna do about them. Um, this project that I'm working on, the National Strategy, it does focus on the, the, the domestic side of things, the post-border stuff. Um, and that obviously involves a whole ton of people who have been working in this space for a long time. So um, while MPI um, or Biosecurity New Zealand has a responsibility to provide national leadership, which is specified in 12A of the Biosecurity Act, 12B specifies sort of um, regional agencies and, and anybody else can be a management agency um, to undertake um, biosecurity functions. Um, and we've got a range of tools, pests and pathway management. We have the Northern Regional um, Pathway Plan and, and Pest Plan there. We've got the development of an interregional plan for the top of the north um, four regions. Um, we've got some amazing management happening down in, in Fiordland um, and top of the south. And yeah, just really uh, just acknowledge the amount of work that's happening here outside of um, obviously outside of MPI and by researchers and non-government organisations as well, industry and community. So um, we want to create a nationally coordinated approach for this because at the moment we have things occurring that's a little bit haphazard um, and there's no sort of strategy for what we want to achieve and what values we want to protect. Uh, so I want to look to build a working partnership with um, everybody involved in this space uh, to, to build on this work, um, amplify it, align the existing resources that we have and gain agreement on where we want to go and what, what we want to protect, what values. Um, and really move the system, which is quite reactive at the moment, into something that's proactive, that looks at the pathways, that looks at preventative management, um, and that we can all contribute to. This whole team of 4.7 million, which is part of the, the Cortato or Biosecurity 2025 program, um, that everybody has a role to play. And um, really cool to hear the citizen science being mentioned because that's a huge part of it, of, of people being our eyes and ears. Um, and looking out for things that might arrive um, so that we can get those early detections and get onto active management. So, as I said, really want to look to have a, a co-design approach. So I'm, I'm looking to you guys as researchers um, to be part of the, the technical uh, working group side of things. And um, this, is, this is really just an intro to this project and um, want to connect up with anybody who might be interested in contributing to it as well. Uh, obviously, it's it's a big it's a big one, and uh, it's not something that we can do on our own. Um, and that I think for this this particular piece of work, it's really important to have that bottom up development of the strategy. There's some regulatory approaches that we could look to implement, but there's a whole lot of non regulatory stuff like behaviour change and getting people to care about this stuff. Why does it matter that our marine um, environment might be changing because of invasive species? What values are being impacted? Um, and then also what tools can we look to develop? We might not have um, a lot of management um, tools at the moment, but that could completely change in 10 years with the technological advancements that we're looking at. So I think there's a whole lot of um, benefits and opportunities um, for this, especially for the scientific um, community to, to be a part of this piece of work. Um, we need to know, just as what's been said today, what are the impacts of some of these pest species that are already present? What are the emerging threats? So that's exactly what, what Kyle and Irene have, have just spoken to. Um, as I just mentioned, what technological advancements could we look to, to manage species um, or to detect species? And even in the past sort of five years that I've been involved in this space, it's been amazing to see, um, you know, the range of technologies that have become cheaper or easier to use like ROVs, eDNA projects um, and that's really cool to see that we have the the MB project with the toolbox for tomorrow and how that, impl that inputs into the sort of national strategy um, and just at the bottom there I've added in that sort of myth, our mission for the biosecurity system and, and that we want to protect our way of life and that has to be central to this and yeah really central to to research as well. So the project progress um, I yeah, I guess the project kicked off at a pretty um, tough time, uh, 2020, not a great time to start a new project. Um, so it has been it has been a bit slower than um, than expected, but I suppose there's nothing you can do about that in a global pandemic, right? Um, but we've just had endorsement from our Aquatic Director Steering Group for the project design and approach. Um, have seen a huge amount of increased um, marine biosecurity awareness. 
um, and internal alignment of the work that we're doing here, um, noting that, yeah, we've got an opportunity to, to shift things. Um, and 2021, I'll be really looking to kick this off um, and hopefully we can return to, you know, having workshops in person and cups of tea and, you know, maybe a beer afterwards um, just to catch up, which would be nice. Um, but yeah, I'll be really looking to form the, the governance, technical and operational working groups following the same similar sort of format to what's been done in the wallabies and wilding space. Um, and yeah, like I said earlier, really looking to the research community to input on some solid science, which will obviously underpin uh, any sort of strategy that we look to go for. Um, just reframing again those project outcomes, we want to create an agile system which is resistant to future, so uh, future shocks. Um, of that list, um, you see there the sort of the big six, which was part of the, the comms for marine biosecurity. We only have one of those present, but we could be looking at another one turning up tomorrow potentially. Are we ready for that? What are we going to do? What if it happens to turn up in multiple places? Um, how can we make sure that we've got that early detection and active management? Um, and we've got clear outcomes of what we're trying to achieve. So it's giving that direction and leadership. And again, bringing in everybody, you know, this might be spotted in, in a place as remote as putting it in it. And who's there looking, who knows about it, who cares about it. So really trying to build that awareness to the wider New Zealand. Um, and that's it. I um, probably think that's pretty brief. I wasn't looking at the time. I oh, yep, no, we're all right. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. And I've put my email on there. Please get in touch. Um, we'd love to connect up and, and hear from you. Great thing about the marine biosecurity community is it's it's pretty small and we all we all know each other and we all talk which is great um so if i don't know you please feel free to drop me an email i'd love to have a chat and um, hear from you about your work that you're doing your research and how you might be able to input to this project cheers fantastic thank you very much sophia so we have some questions from the audience and we have plenty of time. So the first one is, are there any plans uh, to distribute images of potential invasive species to the public? Um, for example, signature si signage in coastal areas, sorry. Oh, so like an increased comms package? Yeah, I think that it's a big component of um, of the strategy would be just looking at education and awareness. Um, yeah, building up what do people need to know about? What do people need to look for? So yeah, definitely that's, that's one of the key parts of this project is that communication and awareness. Thank you. And another question is, why is the strategy going to focus just on post-border? The best way to manage this is to target before or at the border. Um, yeah, so there's been a ton of development in the in the pre pre border border space, um, and they are looking to do some improvements um, for like the crawfish management standard and input health standards. Um, this particular project, just looking at the post border space, is really acknowledging that there are um, multiple players, multiple responsibilities at the moment, rather than just pre border border being MPI's responsibility. Post border space, we've got a lot of different players. So this is really looking to, um, yeah, create that alignment on what we're what we're doing because there's a ton of effort in this space, um, and we could be all all working together to towards one goal. And again, it's it's MPI providing that leadership, um, but acknowledging that the you know best place for some of this work to happen is is on the ground. Another message. Hello, Sophia. Great mahi. How is Vision Motoranga being brought into this work? Um, yeah, I. I really, really do want to see um, a ton of iwi and haku engagement on this side of things because it's um, that's a huge part of protecting our values, acknowledging our values. So um, it's something that yeah, is definitely in there. And whoever's asked a question, please get in touch. Um, obviously, I would love to build that in and being more more um, of a of a central focus for this. So yeah, that's something that I might not have absolute expertise in, but um, definitely cognizant of that importance of this. Okay, and one last question. Hi, Sophia. Are you looking at hydrological zones to enable aquaculture and restoration in areas where UOs are already established? Um, not specifically in this, but there are um, some offshoot projects that I am working on that do look to look at hydrological zones and um, yeah, movement of species. Okay, thank you very much to all our speakers for today. It was great to have you on this panel and uh, I think um, we had quite a turnout today and amazing questions. Uh, also very um, many thanks to all the people attending this webinar today and I hope to see you again next 
month on the 17th of December, where our topic will be uh, marine pollutions. Have a good evening.